I'm going to ride in the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm going to ride in the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for the judgment day. My Lord, my Lord. I'm getting ready. I'm riding the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm going to ride in the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for the judgment day. My Lord. My Lord, are you ready, my Bravo? Oh, yes. Are you ready for the journey? Oh, yes. Do you want to see your Jesus? Oh, yes. I'm waiting for the chariot because I'm ready to go. I'm going to ride in the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm going to ride in the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready for the judgment day. My Lord, my Lord, are you ready, my sister? Oh, yes. Are you ready for the journey? Oh, yes. Do you want to see your Jesus? Oh, yes. I'm waiting for the chariot because I'm ready to go. I'm going to ride the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm going to ride the chariot in the morning, Lord. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for the judgment day. My Lord, my Lord, I never can forget the day. on that and, and to bring forth God's word in talking about fear. It doesn't happen very often. But you know, I think we're supposed to think about it a little bit. I think we're supposed to have a clear understanding to what fear means. Are you anything like me and when you think of fear, you think of snakes? Or does it strike fear in you when your wife asks or mentions, we need to talk? That's real fear. How about when you were young in school, pop quizzes, finals? That can create fears. Clearly, movies are good at that. We watched a movie the other night. We wondered why they were putting the fear in there. It wasn't needed. Red lights come on behind you. When you're driving along a small road in a sleepy little town in Kansas, when luckily all the officer wanted to do was check my information, tell me good luck on my trip, and ask me why I had driven up there from Florida. I thought it was better than the fear I had of getting a ticket. We think of fear often as something to be avoided, something that we should step apart from. It's a warning sign, and clearly it's used for that. A hot stove elicits fear to not touch. That's a good thing. But there is more than one definition. Why should I live my life in fear and reverence of God? That seems weird. It seems weird to think that, that God went so far as to write me a love letter and you a love letter. And yet in the scriptures, it teaches us that we should fear. Maybe, just maybe, it's because too many 
walk this earth without a concern for a need to be conformed into the image of Christ. And there's maybe a fear missing, that fear of not being in a right relationship with God, that fear of being alone on a stranded island, that fear of not being with the loving God today and clearly at the end of days. I think that's part of the fear that we're talking about. I had a friend once tell me years ago that I, I used to work with. He said he could do whatever he pleased all week long so long as he came back to church on Sunday and confessed. And then he would go out and repeat and do the same thing the following week and then come back to the confession. He was uh, a Catholic and he would confess. And everything was fine. I said, you know, I don't think it works that way. But that was his pattern. There was this missing this unconcern, this missing fear of, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? While fear can be that dread like Adam hiding from God in fear in Genesis 3, fear can also represent this reverence. The prophets equate fearing God with a pious attitude towards him. Fearing God is linked to honoring God. Isaiah 8.13 says, The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. Obeying His commands, it talks about, with fear and reverence in Isaiah 50. The prophets often criticize the Israelites for forsaking God of fear. When speaking of restoration, they actually include restoration of the fear of God. So I want us to look at this as maybe, maybe we need a clear and better understanding of who our God is. To understand that this isn't someone, this isn't something that we could ever be apart from. Why should reverence for God? Because we should re re uh, reverence God because as believers, we call God Father. The first Verse in our text that we look at today in 1 Peter 1.17. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Peter, we're looking at the life of Peter. We're working through the epistle of Peter. Is suggesting that this is what you do when you follow a loving God. Reverence and fear. As brothers and sisters in Christ, God is our Father. We are His adopted children. Therefore, we are to revere Him. To hold God the Father in high esteem, honor, and respect. That's all Peter's trying to reference here. Yes, there are examples of bad fathers. But God the Father is nothing like that. We know that through the rest of Scripture, through the love that is expressed, the love that God is. But it says we should reverence God because God will judge the world. First part of that, since you call on God who judges each man's work impartially, thinking of fear as a means to hold God in reverence and awe, the judgment of God is basically that fear of being apart from our Lord, that separation to not be judged. But we should reverence God also because we are strangers of this earth. And I want to unpack that just a little bit. We're, we're considered strangers on this earth. Live, Peter says, as strangers here. We're strangers. We're a stranger is a pilgrim, a sojourner, someone just passing through. This is awesome because this means that this earth is a journey for us to a final destination. If we are on a journey, that means that we're not where we're supposed to be. We haven't, fi we haven't hit that final resting place. I'll call it home. I sat in a, in a hotel lobby bar restaurant one time eating chicken fingers. I was in Des Moines, Iowa. I was sitting there watching a basketball game, eating the only thing available at dinner because it was a blizzard outside. I was on a business trip. And there was a guy a couple seats away from me that was sitting there. He is in the same situation. They're on business. We clearly didn't want to be, but we had to be and take care of that. We're talking about the basketball game, the dryness of the chicken fingers. Uh, and, and, and our conversation changed. 
it was the strangest conversation because we got to talking about and realizing that we were staying at an embassy suites and not at the Westin that we'd always liked to when he traveled. I don't even know the guy, but he had the same travel patterns that I did. Two guys didn't know each other. Both liked to stay at the Westin because they had what's called a heavenly bed. And there's only one reason why travelers like that. It feels like home. It feels like you're back home. What this guy and I realized as we traveled along was everywhere we go, as much as we possibly could, we wanted home to be with us. We knew that we weren't where we were supposed to be. And heavenly bed got us closer to that. It did for me. Maybe it was me that wouldn't shut up about the heavenly bed, but that's how I remember the conversation. We should revere God because we have been redeemed and we have been giving a path to come back home. That redeemed is, is, is it's a big deal. For you know that it is not of perishable things such as silver or gold. And I think that references anything in this world that we find of value doesn't replace the fact that we were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Lamb without blemish, the fact, precious, precious blood of Christ. As I mentioned, is it possible that we don't fear God because we don't have a clear understanding of who God is? I met with someone last week, uh, and uh, we had an interesting conversation because as she shared with me, she believed God was, or Jesus was, a good guy, a good teacher. But that was it. Couldn't be God. Couldn't be the Son of God, but was a good teacher. And I just sat there kind of stunned. It's okay, you don't know her. Don't try and figure out who it is. I sat there kind of stunned, and I, I got to thinking, how could you come up with such a thought? C.S. Lewis, who was a professor at Cambridge University and once an agnostic, understood this issue clearly. He wrote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, meaning Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. I've had that quote for a long time, and I've wrestled with that, that first off, it bristles the, back, the, hairs, on, the hairs on the back of my neck for someone to even consider Jesus in such a way. But if you think about his teachings, we have to think about if we really want to understand who Jesus was, he was either a liar or a lunatic, or the Lord. It really can't be anything in between. Was he a liar? If, if when Jesus made his claims, he knew that he was not God, well, then he was lying deliberately and deceiving his father, followers. But if he was a liar, then he was also a hypocrite because he told others to be honest, whatever the cost, while he himself taught and lived a colossal lie. More than that, this line of thinking would make him a demon because he also told others to trust in him for his eternal destiny. If he couldn't back up his claim, then he was unspeakably evil. Lastly, he would also be a fool because he believed this so much, he went to the cross and died for it. Many will say that he was a good teacher Let's be realistic. How could a great moral teacher knowingly mislead people even so much about his own identity and then grow, go to the cross for it? Whenever Jesus has been proclaimed, 
Lives have been changed for the good. Nations have changed for the better. Thieves are made honest. Hateful individuals become channels of love. Unjust persons become just. A story in Philip Schaff says, How in the name of logic, common sense, and experience could an imposter that is deceitful, selfish, depraved man have invented and consistently maintained from the beginning to end the purest and noblest character known in history with the most perfect air of truth and reality? How could he have conceived and successfully carried out a plan of unparalleled beneficence, moral magnitude, and sublimity, and sacrificed his own life for it in the face of the strongest prejudices of this age? The only conclusion is that there's no way Jesus could be a liar. Nobody would do that. How about the second part? Was, was Jesus a lunatic? If it's not conceivable for him to be a liar, then couldn't he actually have thought himself of God, but been mistaken? After all, it's possible to be both sincere and wrong. You and I have both met people like that. We have to remember that for someone to think himself God, especially in a fiercely monotheistic culture, And then to tell others that the eternal destiny depended on believing in him is no light flight, a fantasy, but the thoughts of a lunatic in the fullest sense. Was Jesus this kind of person? Someone who believes he is God, like someone today believing that he is Napoleon? He'd be deluded, self-deceived. And probably he would be locked up because people wouldn't be able to handle him making that kind of claim. Psychiatrists put it this way. If you were to take the sum total of all authoritative articles ever written by the most qualified of psychologists and psychiatrists on the subject of mental hygiene, if you were to combine them and refine them and cleave out the excess verbiage, if you were to take the whole of the meat and none of the parsley and if you were to have these unadulterated bits of pure scientific knowledge concisely expressed by the most capable living poets you would have an awkward yet incomplete summation of the Sermon on the Mount and it would suffer immeasurably through comparison for nearly 2,000 years the Christian world has been holding in its hands the complete answer to its restless and fruitless yearning. It's not possible that Jesus was a lunatic. So it begs the question, is he Lord? I can't conclude, like I said, that Jesus was a liar or a lunatic. I I, I can't make that case. The only other alternative is that he is the Christ. He is who he says he is, the son of the living God. He is the Lord. When I discuss this with most Jewish people, it's interesting how they respond. They usually tell me that Jesus was a moral, upright, religious leader, a good man, some kind of a prophet, but not Lord. Can't be accepted. When I ask if they believe Jesus was a liar, they say, oh, heck no, absolutely not. When I ask, do you believe he is a lunatic? Of course not. But at the same time, cannot accept him as Lord. These are the choices. But truthfully, the choice is yours. We have a love letter. A love letter that is broken into two parts. A need for redemption, and the story of the Redeemer. You must choose. You must decide for yourself how that story ends. Who you decide Jesus Christ is must not be an idle intellectual exercise. 
You can't put them on the shelf as a great moral teacher and bring them out when you need a hit. Jesus is Lord in your life or not. That's pretty simple. He's either a liar, lunatic, or Lord. You have to choose. But as the Apostle John wrote, these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and more important, that believing you might have life in his name. Friends, that's why we have a Bible study. That's why we study the scriptures to what God is teaching us about this loving God. It's what the Bible teaches us about our Lord and Savior and the gift of his Son by the redemption of his blood that we might have that right relationship and not have to worry about living in a fear apart from a loving God. Friends, it's why we preach the word. It's why we share what the word says, because it does lend light on this Jesus that is the Christ so that we might have a better understanding as to why we come on Sunday, and praise. Why we live our lives daily so that someone else might read the gospel by our actions. It's a choice. We need to choose whether or not we reverence God. It is a choice. It's a choice that's given to us. We can either act our belief or we don't. Peter teaches us in verse 21, through him, through Jesus, you believe in God. Who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Friends, we should revere God because he raised and glorified his son that might be our Lord, that might bring us to a right relationship. There's no other way. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, I don't think he's a liar. Again, there's nothing to teach me that he's a lunatic. So I have to believe that that's the truth. I have to believe that as I look at Jesus' life, I'm being taught how to live. I don't have to make it up. I don't have to invent a new life. Jesus went along loving people wherever he went. He shared God's love wherever he went. I don't have to invent my life. I'm being taught what that's like. As I think about that, being good makes sense. It doesn't make any sense otherwise. Joshua led the Israelites into a promised land, a place that God had made out for them. Friends, right now what I know is that North River Shore, Stewart, Florida, America, God has laid out for us a mission field to go out and love others to love Jesus Christ. But just like Joshua shared with those who were being led into that promised land, in Joshua 24, now, for, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve a loving God that loves you and me enough That we might not have to worry about this idle wandering about and trying to figure out life. 
this loving God gives us his son who went to the cross, who died for you, for me, that we might have that path, have that way, have that call. Friends, this is all being shared to us through one who thought he wasn't worthy to even wash the sandals anymore of his loving God. Peter, who had denied Christ. Who God loved enough to share with him what he wanted to teach you and me who might think that we might be in that same relationship, that same situation. It's never too late. And it's never too early. Let's pray together. Oh, loving God, daily we make split decisions. Decisions that can change the course of our life or another's in an instant. We have to make these split decisions based upon what we have learned in our lives, based upon what we think about daily and based upon what we believe to be good, bad, or indifferent. Lord, we thank you for your word that we have something to base our split decisions upon. We thank you for the gift of your son that we don't have to figure this thing out alone because your son gives us his spirit. Oh God, we thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. That through that spirit, we continue to learn more and more about your love. Lord, be with us this day and all of our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.